When we did our youth internet safety surveys, what we found is virtually every parent you talk to, we had such high rates of parents saying they were very concerned and they had rules and they had this and they had that. We actually thought that probably there was what we call social desirability involved here, where parents didn't want to say, no, we're not concerned, no, we don't have rules. So we, we didn't find any relationship between kids who whose parents said no, and, and kids who had more solicitations. But we did certainly find um, associations between kids who were troubled, and often that reflects on uh, you know, what's happening in a home, and, uh, and kids who are receiving unwanted solicitations in, um, in our youth internet safety surveys. And then, um, um, we haven't analyzed our new data in the in the police survey, in the police surveys yet. Since, since you're all here, maybe we can get some free advice. Um, as companies, we all have aspects of social networking. Whether some of us are pure social networking, but others have aspects of it. And if we have to focus on the top three, the four, the top five things to do, whether it's technical policy or or education perspective, what would you recommend? You know, one recommendation I would make, uh, partly it's to make things easy to report, to make problems easy to report, but one thing that is coming up in uh, the bullying literature, and the off I'm talking about offline bullying, and also in uh, the sexual assault literature, in prevention of sexual assault on places like college campuses, is bystander involvement. Creating situations where kids are looking out for each other. And partly that involves education, so that we're telling kids when you see this sort of activity online, when you see, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, sexual interaction, sexual conversations having on happening online, for example, uh, you may be seeing a situation where one of your peers is about to get into big trouble. And creating suggestions for kids uh, to intervene and to report, I think that is something that we're seeing as effective offline that could be effective online. Before you, uh, you two also answer, and Dana, um, do you think there's a danger where kids are going to say, oh, wait, narc, that's the narc button, don't press it, don't turn, turn, turn on your friends, and how do you overcome that issue? Well, I think you involve kids in how you set that up, because I think most kids are concerned about safety. Most kids don't want to be harassed by sleazy older men. I mean, a lot of these situations, kids would just as soon do without. But you would involve kids in setting up situations so it wouldn't look that way. I think education is a huge component as well. So, I mean, there's a lot of kids that don't understand because they're underage. Um, sexual pictures of themselves as child pornography. That type of education. Um, education about statutory rape, what it is, why it's against the law, that type of education is really useful. And if I had a world with my own money that I could spend that would be significant, I would, I would get mental health professionals to troll social networking sites and reach out to these young people. We can do it. It's not that we don't know how to do it. It's not that we don't have the, res we don't have the, the, um, the people to do it. We just haven't connected um, yet. And so it would be great. I mean. My, my personal shtick is that social networking sites are such an amazing opportunity to identify at-risk kids before the internet. They were silent. They were so hard to find. Um, and, and here they are. And, and a lot of these kids, you, you look at their profile and you go, wow. And wouldn't it be amazing if we actually harnessed this opportunity to actually do something really cool and get these kids connected with services both online and offline? You know, the mental health experts getting involved was so key for so many situations. I actually tracked, um, uh, I guess it was the 2006, all of the kids who killed their parents, and I went to their profiles. And you know what? All of them talked about abuse in the home or problems that were going on before they killed their parents. 
right, in detail, in graphic detail, where you as a, as a police officer would immediately look at this and go, child abuse in the home, solve problem now, right, critical, critical. But people aren't reaching out to these kids and getting mental health experts and getting people not just trolling looking for the offenders, but trolling looking for the really troubled kids would be really helpful in so many ways. The model is not through schools, but partnering with social networking sites. And um, there are, so p mental health professionals that have a presence online, one that comes to mind is 1-800-SUICIDE, which obviously started as a hotline, and they now have online real-time chat. Mm -hmm. um, because we, we've done research and, and kids who are self-harming are online. I mean, it, it's such an obvious way when, when you're depressed at three in the morning, what are you gonna do? You're gonna be online. Um, so so I, I don't think it's, a sc I mean, schools are wrestling with the whole intersection between face-to-face school-based bu bullying and, and internet bullying and kind of that intersection. And I think it's related but a separate issue. I would say for what we're talking about here that it would be um, social networking sites reaching out to mental health professionals, reaching out to mental health service organizations and saying, we think this is important, work with us um, to make this happen. I guess and the only thing that I would add to all of this is, I mean, obviously I want to, you know, third or second the education um, aspect of it. I think that that's incredibly important here. And I would also emphasize trying to bring peers into the mix, peer educators, peer contact um, as a site, as, as a location um, for teens to, to talk about this stuff. Because I think sometimes um, some of these more adult oriented, the, the adults feels, it feels a little bit more formal, but peers are more accessible potentially. I mean, that's a tested model in the schools as well. And I think bringing that to the internet um, may help here as well. And I guess one, uh, just <coughs> yeah. quick follow up. Uh, um, a lot of um, federal government or sort of lo and local government funds street outreach programs. And street outreach programs are a combination of peers and mental health experts who reach out to kids who are on the street when they're getting themselves into trouble. We need to teach the or treat the digital spaces as a new form of contemporary streets and engage in the same way. And so I'm not convinced that it's just the social network sites that should be paying for it, but it actually should be working with governments, doing the street outreach program, dealing with the, with the numerous um, folks that we've trained to do street outreach, because those who are doing street outreach that are 18 and 19, they know how to use the internet. They're not, they don't need training on that. Great, and so oh. we've got, oh, Janice, really fast, because I've got a lot of questions already lined up. Yeah, Sorry. I just was gonna uh, also say quickly that we need to stop ghetto, sort of ghettoizing the I I idea of online sexual victimization. It, there's not a, um, we need to look at the full spectrum of what kids experience and be frank about it with kids. And the internet is such a better way to do it than say sex education classes in schools where teachers often feel so constricted by what they're allowed to say and what kind of reaction they're gonna get. And, and one, request, one request, could um, speakers identify themselves and their organization please? I mean I know John asked that but some of them haven't been. I think it'd be helpful for us. Sure. So we're gonna go Donna, Dina, John Morris, and then swing over there a couple on this side too. We'll go to Stephen. Hi, Donna, enough is enough. Um, back to a few questions ago. Um, how did you take into account the process of grooming um, when, when you were evaluating aggressive sexual solicitations? For instance, um, you said that, that most of the, the, the teens knew the age of the person that they were dealing with. Well, when did they know? Did they know at initial contact? Did they know throughout the grooming process? You know, and then how also do you take into account um, what you, your findings that they left voluntarily and the role again of grooming, the effective grooming to where they would leave voluntarily? Am I making sense? I, um, we ask young people to describe 
what happened in the particular sexual solicitation. I mean, we ask them to describe the most bothersome solicitation, and if, if they didn't have one that was most bothersome, the most recent. And then we ask them detailed questions. I wouldn't say that what these kids told us amounted to grooming. Grooming, I think, implies two things. First, a process that happens over time that reduces inhibitions and introduces sexuality. It's often something you see a lot more with younger children because the reality of adolescence is they're highly interested in sex already. Um, and you see it in some of the crimes that we found. But these sexual solicitations, as I said, most of these were very mild incidents. They didn't amount to grooming. They weren't prolonged um, contacts that kids had with solicitors. Mo in most cases, the kids just cut off contact with them. Does that answer your question? Hi, Dina Sacco. I'm with the Berkman Center. Um, I just, following up on something that you said earlier and on um, a portion of the online predators and their victims piece that we had in our packets for today, I'm just wondering if somebody can talk a little bit about the use of child pornography um, as something that kids engage in as a conduct and also as something that um, people might use in contacting kids, because that's a big part of this article. Oh yeah, well, so <laughs> for full disclosure, I'm a former federal prosecutor handling primarily child pornography cases, so I'm s I was very interested in that part of the article. So uh, we have data on, on pornography, and, and we're talking about intentional seeking of pornography. And we wanted to understand kind of how often it's happening online, but also how often it's happening offline to kind of get a better context for, you know, what influence is the internet having? I, kn I know that there's some concern that, that with increased ease of access uh, that the internet affords, that there may be sort of this explosion of, of uh, access and, and, and use of, of pornography. And what we're finding is that the percentage of young people who report looking at pornography online is similar to the percentage of people who look at looking at pornography online, offline rather. So that internet and face-to-face -face pornography seeking behavior among adolescents between the ages of 10 and 15 is similar. kids using webcams and engaging in kind of producing child pornography and also in the use of child pornography in the grooming process in the cases where you do have online predators. But I don't know if anything, if it's sort of anything you have goes beyond what's already in this uh, piece that we have or if there's anything you wanted to point out from that or not. We'll have new data from our current study in a few months, but what we found in our second youth internet safety survey was about 4% of the kids had been solicited to create sexual images of themselves and send them to someone online. Uh, I think it was about 25% of our cases in our first uh, law enforcement study involved the production of child pornography in these online meeting cases. And we see a huge variety of ways child pornography is produced, a lot of ways that it's used. Um, so we'll have some updates. We'll have some updates on that. I do think um, one thing about the internet is it, it is a place that attracts voyeurs. So there are people online who are soliciting these images um, and, and exhibitionists, people who are creating images of themselves and transmitting them who have no interest in any face-to-face -face meeting. That, that, that voyeurism and exhibitionism are some, you know, that there's a lot of that on the internet that doesn't necessarily involve any kind of face-to-face -face contact or desire for that. Yeah, and kids are exposed to it. I have to say it's a little disconcerting to be sitting in a, a focus group of eighth graders and find out that most of these kids have, you know, seen 40-year-old guys masturbating on webcams. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm laughing just because it was, as I said, it was disconcerting and they're all saying yuck, but it's a pretty common experience. One other thing is, is that Across the board, the kids don't see the production of content as child porn. And this is actually where education becomes a very, very critical thing. And most of them are even putting together certain kinds of images for the attraction of guys often two to three years older than them. They're not going for the 40-year-olds, but they are often doing it 
for men a little bit older. And they're often doing it to look older, right? Because they see themselves as being able, like, you know, they've got breasts and they're able to flaunt it in a way or perform it in a way where they can show it off. And there's no linkage in their heads that this, that this is child porn. There's no linkage that, that, that putting this up for guys two, three, four years older might be problematic. And that to me is, is above all else an education issue. So John Morris, and then I saw Stephen's hand was up. A little bit off, a little bit different focus. To, um, you know, there there are social networks we're familiar with, obviously MySpace and Facebook and and others. But there are also kind of, for lack of a better term, pre-social networks, uh, uh, Club Penguin, or you know the things that are in between Club Penguin. Um, for, for for that category of more restricted interaction, I mean, d d does your research suggest there are significant problems in the bullying area or in the sexual solicitation area? No. We, we asked, um, especially in the, the second Growing Up With Media survey, so those data that we closed field in December of last year. Uh, the virtual world like, like um, Club Penguin, less than 10% of those who were solicited and less than 10% of those who were harassed said that it had ever happened in, in a virtual world. So there, there are other spaces online where it's much more common. Our data doesn't, um, it, we stop at, uh, though the youngest we go is 12, and those spaces right now are aimed more at children a bit younger than that. Uh, Stephen Balkan with the Family Online Safety Institute. Uh, listening to the pr uh, presentations this morning, I was hugely relieved in a way by the statistics and by the direction that it's all going. And yet I also felt, and I know I said this in the line for lunch earlier, but I felt like I was in some kind of altered universe because this is not the universe that the AGs are sitting in. This is not the universe that the media, particularly the To Catch a Predator type of TV programs, are in. So h how do we bridge this gap? It, it doesn't seem to be, and the whole purpose of why we're even here and why we're going to be continuing to meet throughout this year is to address an issue or a problem that what? May only exist in 3% of cases? What are we doing here, Amanda? I mean, I think this is exactly why we're here, is to help you frame the question in a way that helps to understand what's going on and that the media, in my experience, picks up on the story that scares the bejesus out of the most people. And the story that we're telling here today is vastly less sexy than that. Um, we're talking about complicating and making it less black and white and making it a more of a nuanced story. I think there's still stuff to discuss here. There's still an issue. It affects kids. I think what we're telling you today, and, and obviously everybody else can, can kick in their own thoughts, is that this is a complicated issue and that the kids you really need to be reaching, the ones who are really getting into trouble, who are engaging in behaviors that cause serious harm to themselves, are the kids who are already at risk and who aren't listening. And that's where we need to be focusing more of our energies. And I guess from my point of view, we have a problem as long as, um, one, there's. Psychologically, we're, we're really built to, for fear. That's a, how we're meant to respond. And so we pay attention to things that are fearful. And any time, time media kind of capitalizes on that, they get us to pay more attention to them. And so we create a cycle. They never clarify things, right? I followed a bunch of different cases um, that were supposed abductions due to social network sites. And when I followed them and worked with police officers and talked to what was going on, they ended up being runaways, right? Is that ever clarified in the media? No, it's not. And so uh, one of the things we have a challenge is, is like, what is our role and responsibility in one, educating the media, and in two, figuring out how to actually balance some of this? Because they make a lot of money off of fear mongering. It works really, really well. And that's going to create a disconnect over time. Um, the, you know, in most things that the, the media sort of spirals out is like, you know, the culture of fear, the numbers have been going down, right? Like, violence in schools surprisingly have been going down, which I didn't expect at all. Teen pregnancies going down. A lot of these things that we think are skyrocketing aren't. And so I, I've got more of a question for all of you about how we get back to a sense of reality within our culture. I don't know the answer to that. And, oh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I would just add too that we're so nervous about talking about talking frankly about sex in in this culture, um, as I tried to point out with you know with, always with sexual offenses against kids we want to say it's strangers we want to say the danger is external we don't 
we're not comfortable ta being frank with kids. One thing I think is heartening is that this generation of kids, in my experience, is a lot more comfortable talking about sexual matters than the adults, at any rate, in my generation are. And I, th and I think that's a good sign. And I think that maybe as, uh, you know, as we mature, if we mature as a society, that people will be more open to hearing the real story and less inclined to being so nervous about this. But again, education and candid talk about what's really going on, I think, is key. The other thing is that to the degree that we can help kids report cases that are happening to themselves, particularly since, what, 90-something percent of them are people that they know, that they're afraid to report. They're not going to report their parents to who? Their parents? Right? That, that doesn't work. So to the degree we can use these technologies, not only to find these kids, but also to support them in reporting the fact that the majority of child abuse cases are happening in the home, that's also to our advantage because that solving that problem will solve a huge percentage of our real child abuse cases. Larry Maggid uh, with ConnectSafely.org, but after hearing Dana's critique of the media, I have to confess I'm also a journalist in, in another world. Uh, um, and you're right, there, there is pressure on, on journalists. I've, I've personally experienced pressure from uh, television networks to comment in ways that reinforce the fear-mongering, and, and when you don't do that, sometimes you get less airtime. So it, it's pretty obvious why, why that is so successful. There's a real theme here, and, and we've heard these themes before, but I think this is the first gathering I've been to where, where the theme is unanimous. We have three of the leading or four of the leading researchers in the country, all of whom are saying basically the same thing, showing different studies that are pointing to the same data. Um, one is that many of the victims, if not most of the victims, are compliant. Um, two is that most kids are doing okay, that the vast majority of the population actually does not seem to be suffering any great harm as a result of the internet or the extent to which they're harmed, they seem to be coping with them and handling with them. Um, and three, that there are, there is a significant important minority of underserved youth, uh, in the term we've been talking about them all day, high-risk teens. And I'm not sure I can really ask anything that hasn't been asked before, but I, I still do feel that, that I feel like we're, we're inoculating a population against an illness that is very unlikely to affect most of the population, yet we're failing to inoculate the very people who need that, that vaccine. And it, it just strikes me that, that there needs to be a radical rethinking of internet safety education policy and legislation and, uh, you know, whatever attorneys general do. Uh, we need to really rethink who are we reaching and how do we reach the people who really need to be reached. Sounded like a comment, not a question, so I'm going to keep going in case there are actually questions. Thank you, Larry, though. Sure. Not, not that it was disallowed to make a comment, not a question, but. Hi, Drew Weaver uh, with AOL. It would seem intuitive that abductors, strangers, would use the internet uh, to reach out to children to find them. I'm curious what your theories are on why that's not happening to a large degree. Is it a matter of education that kids, for example, just aren't revealing their locations and therefore the internet is not an efficient way to do that? Well, I think um, um, it's important to recognize that most sex offenders uh, who offend against children and adolescents aren't strangers. The stranger abductions that you read about that get a lot of publicity, of course, because they're so frightening, are actually extremely rare. They're really a small minority of the sex crimes that victimize kids. And the people who commit those sorts of crimes have certain um, characteristics that mean that probably the internet isn't really that favorable to them. First of all, they tend to be people who don't have other ways to get to kids. Um, so, um, so they abduct, so they grab someone who's walking home from school, or they do, they have sadistic tendencies, um, and because of that they use violence. But again, um, those are a minority of offenders. Most sex offenders, um, um, are not violent. 
Most use, uh, if they're targeting adolescents, they use seduction. And as I said, most adolescents are very interested in sex. It's even um, reluctantly, nonetheless, they're drawn into these relationships. With younger children, most uh, um, sex offenders use the authority that they have over kids because they're caretakers or uh, family members. Uh, it's easy to get kids to comply with their desires. So the idea of stranger abductors, um, th that's a, it's a rare kind of crime, and most of those people are impulsive offenders. They're not going to take the time to look for someone on the Internet. They're going to drive by, like some famous cases we've seen, and see a kid playing in their yard uh, or grab someone off the street. It's simply the way they operate. And two things that come out of our data that I think also suggest why it's it's not such a great it's not a great hunting ground as it were. It's one is the ignore delete issue. Is that even if you do contact teens and 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 you actually attempt to make contact with somebody, you're generally quite unsuccessful um, with the most majority of teens. Um, but also that's on data that I didn't present, which is also a part of our um, teens online safety report. Um, sorry, teens and online privacy report which basically suggests that most teens don't actually reveal a lot of information about themselves publicly on the internet. Um, they actually are getting the message on that, particular, um, on that particular message quite strongly and in fact restrict quite a significant amount of information. So it's hard to find information about teens. The other component is, is you want to actually look at how many abductions take place in the United States every year and what that data looks like. Abductions are pretty well reported, although they can sometimes be conflated with runaways. The vast majority of abductions in this country are abductions by the non-custodial parent. Next grouping of abductions is actually by somebody who knows the kid, usually an extended family member. And then you get into this sort of like this vague knowing, right, which is the, the degree in which the neighbors are the um, abductors. So even in the cases of abdu abductors, internet or no, stranger abductions are really small of abductors let alone when you get to internet into the factor. Like as, as you saw in some of the data, even of sex offenses, it's like 1,000 out of 68,000, right? So when you start doing the combination, it, it's where you see that. And so the, it's so much easier to access kids that you see around you if you, ha if you are going to abduct. But even because of how rare that is, according to a source I know from the FBI, um, a stranger abductions of children is about 300 a year. So Perry gets the last um, question on substance. Mike had a question on process, and then we promise um, you've been very generous for your time. Thank you that we will let you go. Thanks. Uh, great work, and you guys are doing and have been doing extraordinary work. Um, I talk to 10,000 kids a month in person, and they often tell me some different things from one of your, your, your studies. And I know that your studies are, are done. They're confined numbers. They're generally adult permission when you're doing it, and, and maybe some of the kids may be concerned about what they're saying. Has anyone done larger work where we set up a social network group or something else and saying, have you ever encountered someone offline and you were sexually exploited against your direct consent? And that, so larger studies where the kids who you may not have spoken to will give us a better sense. In our Youth Internet Safety Survey, we actually ask kids about offline sexual victimization. And uh, we have some, um, anyway, I, I can't remember the exact numbers that we found, but the numbers of kids who admitted being sexually abused or assaulted, and most of these were peer assaults that had, had nothing to do with the Internet, were similar to the numbers that we've gotten in other years, considerably higher than what we saw um, in terms of well, internet. Your, your study was about 1,500 kids, right? Right. Okay. So I'm talking about large numbers of kids, and, uh, kids who may not be comfortable telling you who they are so you can track back to the phone number, however you contacted them, but anonymously to get a sense of how often it's happening. Not, and I absolutely agree with you, no one's tracking down these kids and climbing in their windows at night. 100% of the cases, the kids have gone willingly to the meeting, whether they knew who they were or weren't. Um, and so it's just, is, can we use the power of social networking to get even greater data, although it's not going to be confirmable and truly academic, getting a, a better sense of what the kids are saying when they think we can't find out who they are? Well, 
I would just say, Perry, there are a lot of studies of, of rates of sexual assault done in a lot of different methodologies. I, I don't know one that's used exactly the methodology you're talking about, but there are a lot of studies out there that talk about rates of sexual assault. Right, I'm just internet related on ways of using the, the technology the to find out more. But thank you. It sounds like you guys are saying the answer is no to Perry's question, just because we have to move on. Well, I also want to clarif clarify that there are ways of going at it. Like, for example, it, with another hat on, I work for an organization that works to end violence against women and girls. And so we actually purposely get the girls who have been assaulted, who w are willing to admit it or do so anonymously online. And even from that group, the v I mean, it's horrible what you hear that goes on in a household. And so even in that group, what I'm seeing is that while we don't have the numbers, the percentages of this line up with what I'm seeing when I go from just the cohort, where the vast majority of it is in the home or with people that they know, even in this place where they're admitting to it anonymously. So I don't think that this data is as off as you might think. So I want to give it to Mike for a last process question, but just to throw in one thing as well, process-wise, which is if there are other studies that others want us to look at as the task force with Dana as the chair, uh, we're data gluttons. We, we want it. This is not a point of trying to confine what we're looking at, but expand it. And if there are ones with different methodologies that use social networks in a different way, of course we want to see it. I, I have just finished a book on this topic. I haven't found what you're talking about either. <coughs> but, um, but there are obviously other ways to ask the question. We, want, we just want to get that data and find a way to bring it, bring it forward in the most reliable way. Obviously, we're not going to bring every study if it seems to have a weak methodology, but where there's something credible, we want it, we want it in the mix. Uh, Mike gets the last uh, process question. Okay, thanks, John. You, you answered one of them. Um, I assume we're going to hear from the Research Advisory Board again during the course of the task force meetings. You'll, you'll, Dana, you'll come back to us with updates or other researchers or new research from these folks. Is that, is that how it's going to work? Right. So the research, the research Advisory Board will have sort of multiple steps. Right now we're doing... Um, a, well, we, meaning me and one intern, are doing a literature review of the entire space, including an annotated bibliography that will be available to you in this period. To the degree that you want me to bring in experts to deal with specific topics, tell me. And of course, once we have this, all of the literature out there, and once we actually you know, bring together and convene the Research Advisory Board as a sort of whole, we will put out um, sort of a, a statement and a literature review connected to that so that people have a sense of what's going on and so that you have a sense from all of the researchers in the space that they generally agree on. But for any of you who have things where you want me to specifically look at a topic, you want me to specifically look at a, a study, please send it my way. I'm more than happy to, and I'm more than happy to bring in researchers or to have people speak to specific topics. I spent today focusing on you know, contact issues because that seemed from our last meeting to be the primary concern. And so if there are other concerns that people have, let me know, and I will, look, I will bring in researchers in this space. Okay, and then the, the last thing is, will copies of today's charts be available to task force members? Online you mean the PowerPoints? Somehow. Yes. No, they will be available not only to the task force members, but to the public at large, as will this video. That's one of the reasons that we're videoing it, and one of the reasons it's part of the public. Okay, and one last favor. Can somebody summarize some of the conclusions that were reached today? Or There was a lot of stuff said and a lot of information given. A, a, a one-pager or two-pager well, would be very useful. A huge chunk of it's in that packet that you're sitting on. There's some, there's some reason in there of, of the studies. Um, as well as uh, uh, one sort of well-written, sort of going over a lot of different studies from these two. So well, I actually think, you, unless that's problematic, most of it is in what you have. And there will be minutes as well, so Megan over there um, most likely is typing away um, at this, and as she did for the first meeting, we'll, t we'll represent what we heard. So if the one page that comes out of that is not um, what you need, Mike, we'll get it done. Um, but uh, but hopefully, I mean, the idea is really to be a funnel in a way that, that we can use Use the information. And we're distressed at the idea that you might not retain every single fact <laughs> that we told you today. Janice, that's why we videotaped it, so and we can we watch it over and over again. A test at the hours, end about that was going to talk about percentages. Yeah. It's totally going on YouTube. Down it too. When will the PowerPoints be available? Uh, I'm planning on posting mine tomorrow to our website, the Pew Internet Pew Internet and, and I can email mine. Yeah, yeah as, soon as, as soon as I have them, I will put them in, some, in a space where everybody can grab them, even before the video. The video I'm going to cut, so because you can't really put this online, so that'll take a little longer. Great. So, to our group, what a wonderful, wonderful job you did. Thank you very much for your generosity. <laughs>